Good morning and once again welcome. This lesson is being recorded for Sunday, September the 10th, 2023. This is the lesson that will be presented when we gather together here in Bellflower at the Rose Avenue Church of Christ at 1050 in the morning. And as is always the case, uh, we invite you to come and be with us if you are in the area. If you're anywhere in Southern California, you have opportunity, we would love to have you come visit with us as we gather together to worship God, whether it be at 10.50 in the morning or whether it be at 6 o'clock Sunday evening or and including our Bible studies. We have a Bible study on Sunday morning at 9.45 and again on Wednesday evening at 7.30 and you are obviously welcome at any and every one of those services. We would love to see you um, if you are in the area with us. In the meantime, uh, I will be glad to continue to share the messages that we have prepared for our Sunday services, and I hope that you can benefit them from them in one way or another. So let's go ahead and get started with our lesson for uh, today. Uh, I ask you to turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 20, where today we are going to be talking about being servants of God. And of course, uh, you know, when you think about greatness from a a material standpoint, what is it that often comes to your mind? Uh, you know, when we look at it from a worldly standpoint, people might think of uh, financial success, or they might think of, or they might think of somebody who has fame, or somebody who has some other uh, type of success, uh, power, uh, and uh, uh, or maybe somebody who has just got some incredible talent or celebrity or something like that. And they're looked upon the world as being great because of whatever it is. They're honored by the world and various other things. But I want you to understand that God's concept of greatness is different than the concept that the world has where greatness is concerned. <coughs> Over in Matthew chapter 20, and in verse number 27, Jesus there said, whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. And, and other similar passages say, let him be your servant. And I'm going to tie into this context here in just a few moments. But I want you to note that that is what Jesus observes as the idea of what it means to be great. Now, we are continuing to deal with our theme for last year and this year, which is drawing closer to God. And, and over the course of the past two or three months, we've been dealing with this sub-theme of being a disciple of Jesus. Certainly that is how you are going to draw closer to God. And we, of course, we understand that a, that a disciple is a follower and imitator of Jesus. And so we've noted various aspects of life where analogies are made throughout Scripture, comparisons are made to serving God, and, um, and um, you know, those that things we're familiar with in the world. So today we're going to look at probably one of the most familiar concepts that they would have that those in the Roman Empire would have been familiar with, and that was the idea of servants or slaves and their relationship to those over who were over them. And of course, uh, Jesus and the apostles use this out as an illustration to describe how we, as disciples of Jesus, are to respond toward Him as well as toward one another as brethren, and in some instances, even where the world is concerned. And so that's why I want to take time today to just remind us about what it means to be a servant of Jesus. So let's go ahead and get started with that. And ultimately, the best place to start with understanding what it means to be a servant of Jesus is to look at the example of Jesus himself when it comes to being a servant. Over in Matthew chapter 20 and in verse number 28, Jesus there said, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Jesus makes the point that the reason he came was not so that others would serve him, but rather that he could serve them. In Luke chapter 22, and in verse number 27, on one of these occasions where his uh, disciples are arguing about greatness, he says to them, Who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? 
Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as the one who serves. So Jesus directly em uh, em emphasized to his disciples that he came to serve and he was a servant. And you'll find that in various aspects of his life. Let's just take a few moments and consider some of the things associated with the life of Jesus. If you're still in Matthew chapter 20, I want you to notice the context that leads up to this statement that Jesus made. And we're actually going to begin in verse number 20 of this text. And you find here that the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him, that is to Jesus, with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand um, and the other on your left in your kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? Be baptized with the baptism that I am about to be baptized with? They said to him, we are able. Jesus said, you indeed will drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I, that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those whom it is prepared by my Father. And when the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. Now, in setting up the context here, and we find this to be one of many occasions, here Jesus selected these apostles, and they were anticipating greatness with their responsibility. And I want you to understand that they were going to have a great responsibility. And in God's eyes and in the ideas of the Lord and in the ideas of followers of Jesus, they would hold a position of greatness, but not in the way that they thought it was going to be. So after Jesus makes this statement, he goes on and says in verse 25, Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to come, become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. And as I've noted, this was not the first time that Jesus emphasizes. Over in Matthew chapter 10, where he is uh, sending out the apostles, among the instructions he gives them, as he says there in verse 24, a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they call the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of his household? And of course he's sending them out, but he's making the point that a disciple is not above his teacher. And Jesus is emphasizing, you are my disciples. And in the same way that a servant is not above his master. So the emphasis was, you need to serve. You need to be serving me. You need to be serving others. The same thing in Mark chapter 10, which was another occasion in verses 42 and following. 42 and 43, you read there in that particular text. Uh, where you read there, it says there, you... Uh, you know that uh, those who consider who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and the great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. Whoever desires to become great among you, you shall be your servant, and whoever desires to be first shall be slave of all. And again, Mark is um, uh, again repeating that which we find in Matthew chapter twenty on that particular occasion. So Jesus taught. We have a responsibility to serve. And he emphasized that to his apostles and to his disciples. Jesus taught service in the various parables, in many of the parables that he taught. You know, for example, when you think about the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10, you remember there the lawyer, uh, what's the greatest commandment? And um, Jesus says, you tell me, you love God, love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, and of course, Jesus says, yes. And he says, well, who's my neighbor? Jesus enters into the parable of the Good Samaritan. You know, uh, a man is going from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he's robbed and beaten and left for dead by thieves. And a priest and a Levite, each one of them individually, 
um, see this man on the road and they pass by one on the other side and one stops and sees him but goes on. But then a Samaritan comes along and takes care of him. He bandages his wound, puts him on his animal, takes him to an inn and gives the innkeeper money to take care of him and even says, when I come back, if this is not enough, I'll give you more. And Jesus asks, who was the neighbor? And the answer, of course, rightly was, I suppose, the Samaritan. He's the one that did what he needed. And Jesus said, you do likewise. That's the idea of serving. And that's an understanding of what we deal with when we talk about serving. Over in Matthew chapter 24, as Jesus begins to deal with the judgment, he says there, beginning in about verse number 45, he gives this parable of, of, of servants, good servants and wicked servants. And he makes the point there in verse number 45, who is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards. The master of that servant will come on that day when he is not looking for him and at an hour that he is not aware of and will cut him into an appoint of his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, clearly in context, Jesus has in mind the unfaithful leaders of Israel who were leading the people astray and abusing the people of Israel, but he, he gives the illustration of a faithful servant and an unfaithful servant. And obviously when the Lord returns, uh, they were going to be judged based upon that. Even in the parable of the talents, you have the three servants of the master who goes on a journey, and he gives them talents to manage according to their ability. And those that were faithful while he was gone were rewarded when he returned, but the, the one talent servant was lazy and buried it in the ground, and he was condemned because of his failure to serve his master the way that he ought to. And we could look at many other instances of, of Jesus talking about parables where in one way or another he mentions the idea of servants and workers and, 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 and those who are, are doing things for the master. So Jesus, uh, you know, he often made reference to the idea of service and to serving and of course he was the greatest example when it comes to serving you know for example over in john chapter 4 and in verse number 34 and you find this several times especially throughout the gospel of john where jesus will say my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work in other words jesus was saying and this comes uh, you know, this comes after, after he speaks to the Samaritan woman and his disciples come back. And, and uh, you know, he talks about, uh, 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 he talks there about uh, various things associated with the teachings of her and uh, spiritual food. And, of course, we find on this occasion that they're concerned and he makes this food. My food is to do, do the will of my father. The idea is... I serve the Father. That's everything that I do. Same thing in chapter 5 and in verse 30. I can of myself do nothing as I hear I judge, and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Jesus served the Father. But also and probably one of the greatest examples of how he served in John chapter 13 on the night of his betrayal when he has his apostles with him, and if you put this in context with some of the other Gospels, more than likely this was just another one of those occasions where the disciples are arguing among themselves about who is the greatest. And rather than tell them again, he first illustrates by taking a towel and a bowl of water and he begins to wash the disciples' feet, the apostles' feet. And of course, you remember how Peter says, you're not going to wash my feet. And, and he, was, he was indicating his appreciation of the greatness of Jesus. And Jesus says, if you don't let me do it, you have no part with me. Of course, Peter then says, well, then you know what? Wash my head. Wash my whole body. And Jesus said, that's not needed. It's only your feet that are dirty. And then he illustrates to them, you know what I've done? 
You know, I, I took the position of the lowliest of servants in a household. And he said, I expect you all to treat each other the same way and do the same thing for each other. Now, I'm convinced he was not, he was not on that occasion, occasion instituting a ritual, but he was emphasizing that we need to serve. And that's where greatness is going to be found. And you find that this is toward the end of his life, leading up to his uh, crucifixion. But look at his life. Look at the things that he did for those who were in need. How, how, he, would, how he would heal the sick. How he would raise the dead. How he would go and uh, he would restore uh, a leper. How he would be with his apostles and he would calm the sea because they were fearful. How he would feed the multitudes because they were hungry. And various other miracles and works that Jesus did. Constantly thinking about and serving others. That's who Jesus was. He taught service by his example. He also made application in his teaching. Not only did he have parables, but like for example in Matthew 22 where uh, where he there gives the greatest commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And he said on these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. Jesus was emphasizing our need to love not only God, but to love our neighbors. And the point is, is how do you do that? You do that by serving. He taught he taught service is going to be a factor when we stand before God in judgment. He wants to look at the faith that we have as an active faith. And in Matthew 25, and beginning in verse 31, this is where Jesus describes how the sheep and the goats are going to be separated from one another. And to the, the sheep, he's going to tell them to enter into my fold because I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me. I was... I was in prison and you came to me. And they say, Lord, we never saw you. When did we do this? And he said, you, you did it to my brethren. You did it to me. You served my brethren. It's as if you were serving me. And then he goes on and talks about the goats. Depart into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. I was hungry and you didn't feed me. Thirsty, you did not give me drink. Naked, you did not clothe me. Sick, in prison, you didn't visit me. And again, in, in, in sorrow or surprise, I say, Lord, we never saw you. When didn't we do these things for you? And he said, you didn't do it for my brethren. You didn't do it for me. So you find Jesus. He emphasizes when we stand before God in judgment, he's going to look at the way we have conducted ourselves as disciples of Jesus. Whether or not our, our emphasis in this life was about ourselves or whether it was about others. We need to understand he expects us to serve others. And of course, when it comes to Jesus as an example of service, the ultimate example of Jesus as a servant was his willingness to die on the cross. Again, I take you back to Matthew chapter 20 that we began with in verse 28. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. That's why Jesus came. He came to die for us. Over in Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, and we'll actually begin in verse number 5. You find here in this text that Paul is encouraging these brethren to serve like Jesus did, to be humble like Jesus did. And he says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, and that uh, and, uh, of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Paul there emphasizes, you need the mind that he had. He left heaven. And he did not leave heaven to come to this earth to, to live in a palace and to be 
treated as a, a royal dignitary, he came to serve. And the ultimate act of service that he engaged in, he died on the cross for our sins because that's what we needed so that we could be reconciled to God, so that we would have the ability to draw closer to God. And not only did Jesus do that, when he went back to heaven, he continues to serve even to this day. In Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, where the Hebrew writer is describing how Jesus is our high priest, he says there in verse number 14, Seeing then that we have a, high, a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus is our perfect and sinless high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses, who can intercede on our behalf. In chapter 2, and in verses 17 and 18, we read, Therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the, the people. And in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Now, if you take time to study the work of the high priest in the Old Testament, you will understand that the work of the high priest, and incidentally the whole priesthood, was to serve the people. And they, they acted on behalf of the people, uh, serving God as well. They were servants. And Jesus is, even to this day, the ultimate servant. As he gives us hope when we fall short. He intercedes on our behalf. He stands before God as our high priest. So certainly we can see in Jesus that he is the ultimate example of service. Going back to Philippians chapter 2 that we talked about a few moments ago. Or over in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and in verse number 9, where Paul there makes the point where he says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that through his poverty you might become rich. Or Romans chapter 15, verses 8 and 9, where Paul says, Now, um, now I say that Jesus Christ has become a, a servant to the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the Father and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as he makes the point there. And so he's emphasizing in this text there, uh, he he's emphasizing the point that Jesus came to become a servant, even for the Jews, to fulfill what they needed, and also for the Gentiles. He came as a servant, the ultimate example of a servant. So if you want to understand what it means to be a servant of God, look to the example of Jesus. Let's take some time to also talk about the fact that we are servants. We are sorry. You know, uh, remember, this is, this is a part of our study about drawing closer to God, and it's a part of this uh, dealing with the idea of being a disciple of Jesus, or what we sometimes describe as discipleship. And as disciples of Jesus, service is a part of being a disciple. As a matter of fact, I think, when, I think you cannot separate the concept of the, the term disciple from the idea of serving. We serve our Lord, and following his example, we're going to serve others. So just the concept of being a disciple would, uh, would indicate that. And of course, one thing that we learn about who Jesus was is we seek to imitate him. As Paul said in 
uh, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, Imitate me even as I also imitate Christ. Or Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5 that we've already um, alluded to in, in this lesson, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. <coughs> Talking about his humility and how he left heaven. We've already tied that to his serving. Over um, in 1 Peter 2, 21, For to this you were called, because Christ Jesus also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. We look to the example of Jesus, and he goes on, and he describes the suffering that he endured. And so we learn from that that we too are to be disciples, or we are to be servants, even in the same way that Jesus was a servant. Again, over in Luke chapter 6. And in uh, uh, Luke chapter 6 and in verse number 40, where you read there, a, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. There Jesus ties that to being his disciple. You need to be like your, your teacher. You learn from him what it means to serve. He's the ultimate example of that. So let's make some applications to this. What are some ways that we serve? Well, we serve through love. In Galatians chapter 5 and in verse number 13, uh, uh, do not use this liberty of yours as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. You have there a command that we are to be serving one another as brethren. Consideration to the, the, the fact that um, what makes us servants of others is we are first servants of God. It is our service to God and our service to the Lord that will prompt the way that we serve others. Remember how Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6 and verse 24, said, No one can serve two masters, for either he will love the one and hate the other, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Jesus there emphasized the point that you've got to choose who you're going to serve. Over in Romans chapter 6, a passage that we have recently, recently alluded to in previous lessons, uh, Paul emphasizes the importance of being servants. God be think that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered, and having become set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. You are servants of righteousness. And that's the way you to live your life. Over in Romans 12 and verse 1, he said, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, as the New King James reads it. You present yourself a living sacrifice to God. How do you do that? You serve him. And so we can find over and over that we serve God. And that's going to be the foundation of the way that we deal with others. So with that in mind, let's just, for uh, the remainder of our time, let's just talk a little bit about serving others. What are some things that can help us as we give consideration to how we are to serve others, to serve one another. And I want to specifically mention four different areas to give consideration to that are going to have an impact on how we serve. Number one, we need to have a proper attitude. And incidentally, each one of these has subcategories. But, you know, when we think about the importance of the attitude, that's going to really determine what we are willing to do, but not only what we are willing to do, but the uh, the level of intensity, the level of devotion and dedication we will give to what we are going to be do to what we ought to be doing. Are we going to do it with whole with a wholehearted desire to do it, or, or is it going to be half-hearted and just just enough to get by? Just kind of something that you're doing because you're compelled to do it, or is it something that you want to do? You do it with all your might. We need to have proper attitude. We need to love. 
through love serve one another. You know, you know, think about that good Samaritan. Here was a Samaritan who he, he comes across uh, an individual who is very likely a Jew. I mean, Jesus is talking to Jews. He's talking about a man that was going from Jerusalem to Jericho. And as I understand, both of those cities were Jewish cities. So very likely this is a Jew. And which is why it was extremely shameful for both the priest and the Levite to pass by. But here this good Samaritan comes along and he sees a person that has a need. And he helps him with his need. Friends, that's the attitude of love that we need to have. We see, we see a man, we see a person that is struggling in some way, and we have the ability to help him, and so we do. We need to have an attitude of love if we are to help others. But we also need meekness and gentleness in our lives. When you think about the idea of, of meekness, the idea of that is to be mild and gentle and, and even-tempered, even and especially when you're dealing with less-than-ideal circumstances. That's why Jesus was so meek, is, is because when he was uh, berated by those, he kept his calm. And when it was appropriate, you know, he would allow others to abuse him, mistreat him. And if good can come as a result of that, he let it happen. That's the meekness and gentleness of Jesus. It wasn't cowardice at all. Over in Colossians chapter 3 and in verse number 12, we find there that Paul says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. He gives all these different qualities. And amongst the qualities that we need to have as we deal with each other is we need to have this meek and gentle disposition as we deal with others. We need to strive to avoid harshness. And we need to be compassionate and caring as we deal with others. We need to be gentle and, and, and mild with whatever the circumstance is that we are facing. We need humility, which comes with meekness. And I remind you of that Philippians passage, talking about the humility of Jesus. But, but just prior to that, in Philippians chapter 2, Paul said, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition, but in lowliness of mind, that each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. You think about others. That's the way we need to be treating each other. Over in um, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and in verses 23 and 24, this is one of those passages where Paul is dealing with what we might describe as liberties. Uh, what you're actually able to do, what you need to think about how it affects your brother, and you need to think about his conscience. And he says there in verse number 23, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. We need to think about what is best, where others are concerned, which means if I'm going to serve others, I need to have a humble attitude. I, I'm not serving them looking down upon them as I am doing them. And finally, we need compassion. And think about the idea of compassion. Look into the example of Jesus. You know, over and over in the Gospels, we read about the compassion of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 9 and verse 36, he sees the crowd as having a sheep with no shepherd, and he has compassion on them. In chapter 14 and verse 14, he has compassion, and he heals many on that occasion. In chapter 15 and verse 32, he has compassion, and he feeds the 4,000 men with a, 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 a basically a single person's meal because he had compassion for the people. So we look to the example of Jesus, and we can see that we need compassion. And if we have the type of compassion that Jesus had, it is going to help us in seeking to serve others. But not only do we need a proper attitude, we also need awareness of what is actually happening. 
You know, am, am I aware of my surroundings? Am I aware if somebody actually has a need? Am I looking for opportunities? Or is something going to, ha is something going to have to absolutely just tell itself without uh, any implication whatsoever, declare itself that it is, is a need? Or do I look for opportunities around me to help others? I need awareness, and there's a couple of areas. I, 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 need, I need to be aware of what actually is needed where others are concerned. And I take you back over to Matthew chapter 25 and this uh, passage dealing with being judged by whether or not we served others. You know, are we looking for those who are in need? You know, those, those uh, goats, as they were defined, Lord, we never saw you hungry. Oh, if we'd have saw you, we'd have fed you. But you didn't do it for anybody else. Were you, were you really looking <coughs> to help anybody else? Or, or were you self-absorbed in that? Going back to John chapter 4, verses 34 and 35. This is Jesus, again, interacting with his apostles, his disciples, after speaking to the Samaritan woman. And he talks about his food. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. But notice the next verse. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. Look, look around you. There's plenty of work to be done if you are willing to look. And sometimes that's exactly what you need to do. But not only do you need to be looking for opportunities, you need to be aware of what you are capable of doing. And again, I appeal to the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25, where the master gives each of his servants, according to their ability, something to manage while he is gone. Those who managed it well, they were praised and rewarded when he returned. But that lazy servant who did nothing, he was condemned. I need to be aware of what I am capable of doing. And I need to be honest with myself about that. And, and, and as I'm aware of what I'm capable of doing, I actually, need to, um, I actually need to strive to develop more and strive to improve. In other words, I don't want to stay in a rut you know, often in dealing with the parable of the talents, one point that I like to emphasize is, you know, you have these three servants there, a five-talent servant, a two-talent servant, and a, and a one-talent servant. And, of course, the one-talent servant was condemned, and the five-talent and the two-talent servants were rewarded because they had doubled that which they received. Well, let me ask you this. What if you have a five-talent servant and all he does is two talents worth of responsibility. You know, has he done as much as he ought to? What about that two-talent servant? Will he at some point develop to become a three-talent servant? Or is he going to maintain where he's at and just be content to be there? To, with the best of our ability, be aware of, of what is needed where service is concerned. And what we're able to do, that's what we need to do. You find over in Titus chapter 3 and in verse number 8, uh, where you read there, Titus chapter 2, and verse, or excuse, Titus chapter 3 and in verse 8, you read there, this is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. That word careful that is used there doesn't exactly mean the same thing as what we think about in our language. What it means is to concentrate on something or to seriously consider it. To seriously think about maintaining good works in your life. In other words, you're aware of what you need to be doing. And, and you're aware of others that have the needs. If we're to serve others, that's a disposition we need. But not only do we need a proper attitude and awareness, 
we also need action. In other words, we need to actually do it. You can be aware of what is, needs to be done, and you can have the attitude where you want to help all day long, but nothing takes place until you actually act upon that which you know you need to be doing, and you can do. James chapter 1 and verse 27. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. And as I've emphasized there, that word visit doesn't just mean knock on the door and say, Hi, how are you doing? It can involve that, but it involves doing for them what you can to help them. Faith without works is dead, James would say in chapter 2. Or in 1 John chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, John there would tell us in that text where he says, Whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. We need to act upon serving others. As a matter of fact, until we actually do act, we are not really serving. And the fourth quality that we give consideration to is we need to serve with availability. In other words, we need to make ourselves available when we are needed. One of the things that you need to understand about serving others is sometimes it's not always convenient. Matter of fact, the times when service is often needed the most is when it is convenient, inconvenient. You know, I think of, a, I think of a, a time when a disaster happens within a community or something. And you'll notice there are a lot of times people, they're all of a sudden not interested in the everyday activities that they normally do. They're not concerned about that movie that they wanted to go watch, unless they're self-absorbed. But what they're thinking about is, I have a neighbor here that has a need, and they step up and do that. This is what Christians need to be all the time. We need to be available when needed, and we need to be willing to sacrifice whether we're talking about our time. And, you know, sometimes that's all you can give, but you can give your time. You need, or, or whatever your talents are, your, 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 your abilities. Be involved in whatever the circumstance. Or your resources. If you're, if you're blessed with, with resources, whatever they are, will you use those to help others? You know, Paul, is, he was giving Timothy uh, instructions that he was to instruct to the rich. You know, he warns them there not to be haughty or to trust, uh, to trust in uncertain riches, but rather in the living God. And then he says in verse 18, let them do good that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. They need to be ready to give. They need to be willing to sacrifice, unlike the rich young ruler who was unwilling to part with his resources. You know, over in 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 15, you know, Paul, so concerned about these brethren, says, I will very gladly spend and be spent for your souls, Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I am loved. He's talking about all the sacrifices he was willing to endure for these brethren. I will spend and be spent for you. It wasn't always convenient. I think we need to think about that. You know, was it convenient for Paul to go to all these places? To go to places where he knew he was going to be persecuted? Was it convenient for him to go to Jerusalem when prophets over and over warned him, you're going to be arrested? Was it convenient for that Samaritan to stop his journey, whatever it was, and help this man who had fallen among thieves? Let me ask you this. Was it convenient for Jesus to die on the cross because you and I are guilty of our sins, and we needed him to do that so that we could be reconciled and draw closer to God. We need to make ourselves available, and if we are to serve, that's what we need. So here you can see four qualities or four areas to give consideration to. We need to have a proper attitude, 
We need to have awareness, we need to have action, and we need to have availability. And friends, that's how we serve. One final point as I wrap up this lesson. Serving others can lead to opportunities to reach others. You know, if we are concerned about others, of course we need to be concerned about our brethren. And, and as I've noted, even in these studies here, our primary focus is on our brethren. They ought to be our priority. But at the same time, we have to love our neighbors. How are you going to win others to God if you don't love your neighbor? And you know one of the best ways to love your neighbor is by serving. By doing what you can to serve them. James chapter 2 and verse 8 called it the royal law. Jesus talked about how we are light and how we are salt. And being light in verse 16, he said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Paul over in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and in verse 19 said, Though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. I serve so that I will have the opportunity to hopefully preach the gospel to others. To the Jews I became as a Jew that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law as under the law that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law as without law not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those without law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker of it with you. Paul said, I become all things to all men, and my hope is that I can win all to him. I guess something needs to be said about this here when we think about this. And that is we need to clearly understand that we're not doing these things just for the purpose of hoping that there's an open door. We do it because we care about our neighbors. But the bottom line is when we care, opportunities are going to present themselves. And there is a distinction between those two things. There's, there are those out there who uh, advocate what we describe as relationship evangelism. Based upon a good idea, but it goes too far. And the idea of re relationship evangelism, it, 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 it's the idea of you look at your neighbor, you pinpoint certain people, and you start doing things just for them with the hopes that you're going to be able to get an opportunity to open a door to them. But when you find out they're not interested you abandon them and go to somebody else. That's not what we're supposed to be doing. We love our neighbors for one reason, because they're our neighbors. And hopefully, that will lead to opportunities. Hopefully, you will find that your neighbors will see your good works and want to know more about why you live the way you do. And that might open a door for you to teach the gospel to them. And ultimately, that needs to be what we are striving to do. People need to see Christ in us. Not just hear that we believe in him. It's our greatest asset in trying to lead others to him. So there you can see how a disciple is a servant of God, a servant of Christ. And in the process of being a servant of God, a servant of Christ, you're going to be a servant to one another. And friends, let that be our goal in everything that we do. Think about that and the lesson is yours. And if you would please bow with me at this time. Our dear God and our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for everything that you've done for us. We thank you that you've given us your word so that we have a greater understanding of who you are, your love for us, and what Jesus did for us, what it means, and what you expect of us. Dear God, help us to appreciate your word, not just appreciate what it says, but also to strive to follow what we are called upon to do. Dear God, give us a servant's heart. 
as we go through this day and through this week. And help us in all that we do to continue to put our trust in you. We ask this through your son's name. And amen. And again, I want to thank you for listening to this lesson. I hope that you find great benefit in the things that have been said here. And that this will be something that will help you as you go through this week. So let your light shine. You know, find a way to help somebody that has a need. And let your actions speak louder than your words. So thank you for listening. Have a good day and a good week.